Hello and welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. I'm joined once again for this episode with Ernie Kiros and Haley Ringel. Welcome to the show, both of you. Hello. Hello. And Ernie and Haley were on the last episode to talk about the Phoenix Film Festival and all the great movies they saw during the festival. We discussed narrative feature films last time. And uh, this time we're gonna be talking about documentaries, which is always, I think, um, often one of the best parts of a film festival. Ernie and I talked about this with South by Southwest uh, recently. Like, uh, even if sometimes the narrative features are not very good at a film festival, there's almost always at least a good handful, if not more of documentaries that are really excellent. I think that's partially because uh, documentaries are a little bit easier for, um, you know, first time or, um, lower budget filmmakers to make, whereas a lot of times with narrative features, you need to have a pretty significant budget to get, for instance, good actors or good, you know, good sets, those types of things. Whereas documentary, if you've got a good idea and you know how to get your camera in focus, you can maybe make something decent. <laughs> so, um, so what did you guys think in terms of the overall, you know, documentaries you saw at the festival and, um, you know, did, was there any kind of like bigger takeaways from the festival in terms of the documentaries before we launch into the individual reviews? Uh, yeah, actually, before we launch it, yeah, I do definitely want to, I felt like there was maybe a theme going on and I did talk to one of the, the programming director or executive director. Uh, he did feel like there was, there was a lot of documentaries about personalities, about, you know, big, important people. Uh, so I, the three that we'll be talking today, will will cover that, but there were a couple more that, that we don't have time for, but there's one on Yogi Berra called, uh, it ain't over that I thought was really good. And even if you don't like baseball, uh, you know, Yogi Berra is like such a big pop culture thing. I think that was one worth checking out. Uh, and there was one on Steph Curry, the basketball player, which, uh, I didn't see, but, uh, yeah, there was just a lot of films about sort of these larger than life personalities. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, that was, that was sort of my takeaway. Yeah, I saw the Steph Curry one and I'm not a basketball fan at all and I really enjoyed it. So I highly oh, recommend really? it for, for anybody who, um, you know, wants to, you know, learn about more about him and, you know, a good documentary. I have to say I'm not a basketball person per se, although it's probably one of my favorite sports if I was to have a favorite sport, but I am a big Steph Curry fan. Um, for uh, different reasons, so well then you um, you will definitely like it, Angela. I really liked it. So. Okay, I, if I just get to like yeah. look at him for ninety minutes, I'll be happy with that. So. <laughs> I think I think you can kind of say that about all of our films. Like if you don't, if even if you maybe are not a fan of that particular person or whatever they're doing, I think there's enough. They they do enough to sort of connect them to larger culture, so that mm -hmm. you can understand sort of their significance and sort of their impact on whether it's music or, or film or sport or whatever, uh, that I think you should watch these, you know? And I think even, and you should specifically watch them if you don't know anything about this person or you don't like, oh, I don't care about them or, or their whatever they did, then you definitely should, I think you should watch them. Yeah, great. And it seems like there were a lot that you guys picked that were about, you know, were more of a, um, Rather than like, you know, for instance, a political issue or a, you know, issue based, it was a lot of um, personality uh, based documentaries. Yeah. So the first one um, that I'm going to talk about is called Little Richard. I am everything. Uh, and this is another one that um, I, it's available on streaming, I believe. I think it has a very limited theatrical, um, but I think it's available on Prime and some other platforms. Uh, and this is essentially about Little Richard. Uh, which I think everyone kind of knows about him or, you know, to some extent, but this, I thought it did a really good job of this, this kind of sounds maybe st stupid or whatever, but putting him in the context of being like a queer icon. Like I never, I never thought of him as a queer icon. I, I never yeah. once yeah. thought, I just thought of him as, as a musician, uh, but it really goes into how 
uh, how groundbreaking he was for uh, queer identity it, at a time, you know, this is 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and also, you know, breaking color barriers of, of, you know, being like the first black entertainer, like on primetime shows uh, and getting, you know, on the top 40 charts. And, um, and he was really a groundbreaker in so many regards and really didn't get the credit that sort of he deserves. Uh, and so I think this is a good film to sort of uh, sort of bring him to light to sort of some, you know, newer generations and even people like me who, you know, I'm, I'm 50 years old and I still don't know a lot of this stuff. Uh, mm. So that is a really entertaining film. And like I said, even if you don't know his music or like his music or whatever, I think for, for the groundbreaking aspects and his, what he was able to do for laying the groundwork for like Prince and even like Harry Styles and David Bowie, like everyone who sort of came after him uh, sort of owe a debt to him and what he was able to do. Yeah, I saw a lot of parallels to Prince, obviously. Uh, you know, I Prince is hetero, but um, he obviously is very, um, you know, uh, a lot of the same mannerisms, a lot of the same, you know, jumping up on the piano and, and you know, screaming and, you know, a lot of the same, uh, you know, mannerisms and kind of, you know, what we know Prince as is kind of what we know Little Richard as. I'm really excited to see so, this one. It's getting phenomenal reviews. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Haley. Yeah, so I really liked it. Um, you know, I obviously knew some about him, but not really, you know, just like Ernie said, kind of thinking about him as kind of a queer icon. But it also was sad because later in life, just like Prince, he really embraced um, his religion and kind of denounced his, you know, started dressing very proper and, you know, I'm not gay anymore. Um, you know, God is, you know, my love. And, you know, so that was really sad, kind of the later part of his life. Um, you know, he never really fully embraced his homosexuality, um, you know, when you're a little bit older, which is typically when you normally do, you know, you finally come out and you're like, okay, this is who I am. And so his was kind of backwards. Um, well, he was raised in the black church too, and that's gotta be pretty difficult. Um, yeah, I yes. think he, yeah, he was very really conflicted and he was very, you know, he grew up in a, in a time, it was so, like Haley said, it was so bizarre. Like when he was younger, uh, you know, in the forties and fifties, I felt like, you know, there was less, less acceptance of gay people. And then as society in the sixties, seventies and eighties, and they became more accepted, he kind of went the other way. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's, a, yeah, it, it is a little sad of kind of how, conflicted he was and how he sort of denied his own identity. And then also sad how, um, you know, white musicians kind of took his songs and made their own versions of it and then became more popular uh, because, you know, his music might have not been for everybody, but if you have this very safe white guy singing his songs, you know, that song can be very popular. So it definitely was a good look at, um, you know, him, but also the music industry and how it's changed. Um, and kind of similar to what a lot of people criticize Elvis Presley for taking, um, you know, black musician style and music and becoming very popular um, while, you know, the songs that he did, um, you know, those musicians weren't as. Um, so, uh, you know, if you love music, if you love, um, you know, learning about, you know, obviously an iconic uh, musician, you're, you know, you're definitely going to love this film. And I understand it kind of avoids some of the usual the talking heads. I mean, I think there's some of that in there, but from just some of the reviews I've read, it, um, it, it it's not your kind of like standard just by the book documentary format. So I think that's also pretty exciting. I was a little surprised. I saw, you know, HBO and CNN produce the movie, but for some reason it's not available yet on HBO. So I've been waiting to see it. It's on on demand where you'd have to pay, but I'm I'm waiting because I'm assuming since HBO produced it, eventually will be on HBO Max or soon to be called Max and one of the stupider moves I've heard of recently, but that's a whole other thing that I won't get into. <laughs> Let's drop the part of our name that's actually about quality and just call ourselves Max and no one knows what the heck we're actually doing. But anyway, yeah. Um, but uh, but I, I'm assuming eventually it will probably come there, I would think, if it's produced by them. I would think, yeah. Yeah, right now it yeah. is on on demand and it had a, you know, it's had a short theatrical run. So it sounds like I'm definitely excited to see that one, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, so on to the next film. Uh, the next one is called Judy Bloom Forever, and it's about Judy Bloom, the iconic young adult and adult fiction writer 
Uh, she shares her story, the controversy surrounding her books, which are, talk about puberty and sex, which is not normally what um, you know, children's and adult, young adult books talk about um, so candidly, especially um, in the 50s and 60s, and um, the many writers and fans who loved her work. Um, I really liked hearing her story because I had no idea that she was kind of this housewife who, you know, tried to play the, the you know, um, the housewife role, which you did in the 50s, but always felt like there was something missing. And that's why she started writing and ultimately kind of broke out of her shell and left her husband and explored this role, um, you know, and she's written so many iconic books. Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, Blubber. Um, I was a big reader. I still, not as much, but I would, you know, my summers were spent going to the library, getting as many books out as I can, and literally just reading all day. Like, my parents would be like, go outside and play. And I'm like, no, I'm reading. You know, so. <laughs> that was me too, I really... Haley. <laughs> that was me. I was so a reader. I loved, I, I was a big Judy Bloom fan, and I really loved hearing her story. And now she is 85 years old. She owns a bookstore in Key West, um, selling all those banned books. And still to this day, they're still banning her books, which is so crazy. Um, you know, in the 50s and 60s, they were, you know, risque. But to me now, it's like they are not, you know, I mean, I guess I don't have kids, so maybe. But um, and also I loved hearing her story, how she became a therapist for so many young children who felt they couldn't talk to anybody. And so they wrote to her and she wrote back. And so she had several pen pals for these kids who you know, uh, felt her books really spoke to them and had no one to talk to and felt that Judy Bloom understood them because of her stories. And so in the film, they talked to a lot of those uh, um, young, you know, those women and men who wrote to her and not only just everyday people, but also uh, Molly Ringwald, Lena Dunham, Samantha B. Um, you know, she really made, uh, you know, a mark um, in a lot of people, you know, a lot of young readers' lives. And so I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, myself yeah, included. It. Yeah, go ahead. Or, sorry, Ari. Oh, I was saying. No, yeah, I enjoyed it too. I and I'll. This is definitely a case of of one where even if you think like, oh, this has no appeal to me. Like, I never read a Judy Bloom book. I obviously know who she is, but I still there's still enough in the film that I think even if you don't know who she is, you haven't read a book, you're gonna enjoy. It, you're gonna like it because, yeah, like Haley said, I mean, she. Uh, yeah, she became lifelong friends with a lot of her readers that just, uh, you know, had nowhere else to go and, and, and felt like she, you know, here's this author that kind of understood her. Uh, one of the touchy moments is, you know, this lady uh, who ends up graduating uh, and she invites Judy Bloom to her graduation, like her, over her own parents, like her own parents couldn't make it to her graduation for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Uh, and she invites Judy Bloom to her graduation. And, and she Judy Bloom's husband. Yeah. And, she, and she goes and and people are like is judy bloom here and Greg, like what is she doing here you know um but then also championing uh first amendment rights and, and championing uh fighting pushing back against the uh book banning um so i think uh you know I, I she's a remarkable woman and she's like still in her 80s looks amazing is still active and 85. doing stuff uh and it's crazy and uh and it's just, it's also remarkable that finally her most famous book is now finally a movie and that's out in theaters. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, get your Judy Boo clicks. And I think it's it's on Amazon Prime uh, and I think it's it's free for uh, Prime it, users. Yeah, it is. I watched it. Um, so Confessions, I was a huge Judy Blue fan when I was uh, in elementary school and middle school. And so I was one of those kids who wrote to her. I actually wrote her a letter. Oh. Um, I have identified a lot with her characters, uh, probably a mix between Blubber and Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, because I grew up Catholic and so had like a lot of talks with God. But I was also, as Haley knows, a kid that was bullied um, mm -hmm. and didn't have a lot of friends when I was in, uh, I know it's hard to imagine now, but uh, uh, when I was in elementary school and in that period, very low, I was a pretty lonely kid. And so her books really spoke to me. 
um, as kind of a young, lonely female going through a lot of the things that I could relate with her protagonist in her book. So I did write her a letter. I'm really kicking myself. In fact, my husband and I were talking about this yesterday. He was like, did you keep it? Because she did respond just like she did to those oh. girls. And the, she did write a, it was short, you know, it was like a picture of her. And then she wrote a handwritten response. But I think she was known for that, that she would write, which is kind of incredible. Like you think, how did she have the time with raising two kids? Because she said basically her husband in that period was, um, I mean, I think they did get divorced in around, 80 so maybe so when i was writing to her so these books came out in the 70s and uh, i was writing to her in the 80s and so um you know maybe she had more time then but she was you know getting thousands and thousands of letters a year and she managed to still write a short message to every single person that wrote to her and i wish i had kept it this is one of the times where my non-hoarding tendencies to just throw things out did really did not uh, I kind of wish I had it still, but the book was, so the movie was really kind of special to me to hear because I didn't know about her personal life. You know, I just read, like Haley said, I was one of those kids. My mom was a voracious reader too. She would take me to the library and we would just get stacks and stacks of books. And um, I don't remember if my local school carried her books or not, because I know in the eighties, they were starting to ban a lot of her books because I'm pretty sure I got most of her books at the library. Yeah, me too. Um, but I, but I loved her, her books and it is funny. It's too bad. We didn't get a chance to review. There's just a uh, adaptation of one of her books just came out in the theaters this weekend. Are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. And I, I'm not sure if it's getting good reviews or not, but kind of it is. interested to see it is. Okay. Yeah. That's, it's interesting uh, yeah. that Several so people few of her, have seen it so few like of it, her books so. have been made into movies. A few have, I think fudge and maybe um, Iggy, but um, a lot of them haven't been. And I think it's partially because of the difficult subject matter that she would take on. And it is interesting that they came out in the seventies and she really was just really popular. Um, almost instantly when they came out and they weren't really controversial. They even talk about that until Reagan came in and the moral majority, you know, um, started to take over because the seventies, her books were out there and there wasn't these protests and people burning them and everything. But then in the eighties, all of a sudden these books that had been out for 10 years became horrible for children to read. And you had people like Pat Buchanan, you know, they show the scene with Crossfire with him saying, you know, why do you have a scene of master, you know, why do you have masturbation in her book? And she said, why are you obsessed with one line in an entire book? That's not even about that. You know, like, why, are, why is that the only thing you're focused on? You know, cause the, the character of Dini or Dina was, it was actually more about her going through scoliosis, which, you know, was another thing for a young girl like myself, you know, if your body's changing or you have a disability, you know, she was writing about these issues that like nobody else was writing about. If you got other books at the time, you got, you know, Nancy Drew series or, um, oh, what was the Sweet, Sweet Valley, Valley High? High? You know, they were all very like more cutesy and like, you know, maybe they had crushes on boys and things, but they weren't taking on these heavier topics that, you know, you really yeah. could actually identify with and that kids are already thinking about, but people don't, adults don't talk to you about. So, um, so yeah, the movie was really meaningful for me. And I have to say, I was just shocked that she's 85 because she looks fantastic in the movie. She, mm -hmm. She's a real spitfire still. And it's so cool that she owns a bookstore and that people can mm -hmm. just go to Key West and see her at her store, which I thought was pretty, pretty neat. So, so this was a really think, great one for me. I, I think that's why people like her too, because she's always been accessible. Because when you have somebody who writes back to you, you can go to her bookstore and talk to her. It becomes more of kind of, you know, in this day of social media where you can possibly talk to, you know, somebody, somebody can respond to you. Like back in the day, you didn't really have that. And so it's nice to have, you know, uh, somebody who actually responds to you as a real person. And I think that's why she's also so beloved. Well, and she also seems like she is the person she is in her books in a way, like, you know, I have to say, like, I feel bad for the kids, you know, it's like, I thought Harry Potter was great. And then it turns out, you know, the author is this huge transphobe, but, uh, you know, like Judy Bloom kind of comes off in the movie, at least, you know, like that how she is, she believes that these are things kids should talk about and know about. Yeah. And she, you know, she feels like sexuality is something we shouldn't be um, sexual, not just sexuality, but just your body, just things that just happen to you naturally it shouldn't be something we should be ashamed or disgusted by. And it shouldn't be such a mystery and that yeah. we should treat kids with a lot more respect and give them a lot more credit than we do, because that's one of the things I think comes across when she writes back to you is she's writing to you, not in a pandering way. You know, she talks to the kids when she writes back to them, you know, their issues are very real to them and very serious to them. And she doesn't take it. She doesn't treat it like, oh, you're just a kid. What do you know? You know? Yeah. So I think um, that really came across. It's a very straight ahead documentary, nothing earth shattering here. Her kids are in the movie and, you know, it is more of the talking head style, but I think it's just such an interesting topic, especially because 
this is still going on right now in Florida. They're banning our books, you know, where she lives. And so it's still happening, um, which is incredible and really sad, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like I said, even if uh, for the men in the audience who maybe didn't read any of her books, I think it's still you need to watch it because I think it does touch on like culture wars and First Amendment stuff and just all this stuff that uh, I think is still relevant. Yeah. Um, and she did, and she did books have for books boys too. From yeah. the boys, yeah, which I didn't realize either. Yeah. Fudge, yeah. Fudge was a male character that was a lot of fun, and then of course she was written some adult novels as well that you know mm -hmm. um, that they yeah. talk about in there a little bit because those are a little bit more risque than her kids' books. So, mm -hmm. but see, yeah. unlike Haley and Angela, I spent my entire summer in the movie theater, um, <laughs> avoiding reading. So um, anyway. <laughs> I watched uh, a lot of movies too. I had no life. So like I said, I had no friends. So we watched a ton of movies and I read mostly books, but I just didn't go outside. I was either indoors reading movies or indoors <laughs> watching. Well, I mean, who goes outside when Phoenix in the summer anyway? So, you know, I was usually in the theater or at home while reading books. So, um, so our last movie is called Still, a Michael J. Fox movie. Uh, and this is a documentary about Michael J. Fox. Uh, I, had, I saw it at Sundance. It's coming out in a couple of weeks, I think it's getting a limited theatrical run, but this is going to be on Apple TV. Um, and this is, I mean, it's basically about Michael J. Fox, and it's about his life and sort of uh, his rise to stardom uh, in the 80s and sort of in becoming this huge, huge, huge deal. And sort of like everywhere you looked, it was Michael J. Fox, Michael J. Fox. Uh, and then about him dealing with his Parkinson's and um, sort of the last uh, phase of his life of, of uh, you know, sort of looking back and and what he was able to accomplish uh, and, and the and the work that he's doing to sort of uh, to fight for Parkinson's research. Uh, so, I think I think again, this is a good film for. There's obviously the nostalgia factor. There's gonna you're gonna get a lot of uh, your nostalgia fix if you're a child of the '80s. You're gonna get all the Back to the Future and Family Ties stories. Uh, but and then uh but even if you don't know who he is i think you'll probably have seen his films so it's good to sort of like learn more about him but then also yeah, like, learn about uh the serious issues that he's been dealing with ever since his diagnosis um so i i enjoyed you know again not anything groundbreaking or relativatory there's no big secrets or anything uh it's just a straight ahead documentary about his life he's still married to his his the girl his girlfriend from the from the TV show, uh, you know, Tracy, the, yeah, Tracy, family ties. Uh, from Family Ties. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, it was all together. It was a very, you know, yeah, it does deal with some sad stuff, but it, for me, it was very warm and uplifting, and you know, uh, again, good to reminisce about all the the fun times in the eighties. And I also liked um, that they included a lot of footage from back in the, you know, from his movie, lots of footage. So some of the stuff was told through that. Um, you know, so I thought that was cool. And also um, him kind of trying to figure out when he should let people know about his Parkinson's. He hid it, I think, for seven or eight years. So they showed footage where he was like, oh, well, I always held something in my hand or I always was moving. So it wasn't evident that he was having uh, medical problems. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting, kind of going back and seeing what he was doing um, and kind of his internal struggle because he didn't know um, what would happen, you know, because he and, you know, he was diagnosed in his 20s, you know, and he was at the height of his career. So obviously it was, you know, very devastating for him. Oh, wow. Um, I had no idea he was diagnosed that early because I thought it was sort of later, I guess because he did yeah. hide it. I, you know, it was when he started yeah. to have real show visibly where he couldn't hide it anymore. That's interesting. Yeah, so they showed a lot of footage where he did certain things to kind of, you know, hide it. So that was interesting that they actually showed that. Um, so I, I like the film. I was disappointed it was just in his voice. Um, they showed his wife and they showed his kids, but they didn't really interview them too much. And I would have really liked to have somebody from the foundation, the Parkinson's Foundation, kind of talk about what he's done for um, other people who have Parkinson's, because when you think of Parkinson's, you think of Michael J. Fox, you know, and so I'm sure he has, I know he's raised millions of dollars, but I would have liked maybe other people who have Parkinson's to talk about what he meant in their life, um, you know, being this big star who has dealt with this and, and maybe even someone talking about why he possibly got it so young, because mo a lot of times you get it when you're older. So I liked hearing his story, but I felt like there was a lot of unanswered questions afterwards that I was like, oh, I mm -hmm. wish they would have 
or maybe, you know, maybe have talked to other actors who worked with them. This was very much like just him talking. It was very much his narrative. And, um, you know, uh, I, I enjoy when other people talk about him and kind of what he meant and maybe telling funny stories, you know, when he first met him. The funniest thing was, I can't remember the name, but when he got Family Ties, um, they did not, one of, one of the producers did not want him to be that character saying, oh, he's never going to be on um, Lunchboxes. And when he when he became such a big star and when his face was on a lunchbox, he made sure to send a lunchbox to that guy and say, oh, really? You know, yeah. so that was funny. So you, funny. he did tell funny stories from his aspect, but I would have liked to hear other people talking about him and especially the Parkinson's community talking about what he meant for, um, you know, for Parkinson's. Well, and he's had to be such an advocate for raising fund funding. I know, and um, during the the big the, during the Bush years, there was this big debate, probably still going on, about stem cell research that would really help get a cure for Parkinson's disease, or at least better treatments. And um, of course, there's been a lot of blocking of that kind of research. And he was out there testifying in front of Congress about how this research is needed. And so he's been a real hero in that well in that way for um, research that would help you know cure or at least find better treatments for some of these diseases. Uh, one thing about Michael J. Fox is, you know, his film as a film actor beyond Back to the Future, he's never, he's always really been more of a TV star. But um, what, during COVID, I started watching, I watched all of the seasons of Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is a show I hadn't seen before COVID. But then I, you know, start watched all 11 seasons. And there's an episode where Michael J. Fox is on. And it is one of the funniest episodes of the whole series. And he is so funny in it. And they're actually making I don't say they're making fun of the Parkinson's, but needless to say, Larry David is being a jerk and that's plays into it with his Parkinson's <laughs> yeah. and they're in Michael J. Fox comedic timing, even at this point where, you know, you can really see that the disease has taken a hold of him is so fantastic in that scene in that one episode. And I was watching it and I was just marveling. I mean, this guy is a, is a, is a comedian and he's also a TV star. When he comes on, the screen just lights up on that show. I mean, he, he does not miss a beat on his comedic timing. Like there's a scene where he's getting a soda out of the fridge to hand to Larry and then the soda explodes when Larry opens it and Larry's like, did you do it on a purpose? And you're like, Michael J. Fox goes, no, it's the Parkinson's, you know, cause they're kind of fighting. And so, but just the way he plays it off, it's just so funny. So I'm excited to see this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, this movie does a good job of reminding you if you, and if you never lived to that era of, like, yeah, just what a big deal he was. I mean, he became a child after, like, like you know, right out of the gate and, uh, you know, just became instantly popular because he does have that that charisma, that magnetism of, like, you know. Yeah, this he's actually like, a real TV star, you know, like, there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's kind of like the everyman, but he's, he's, like, he's got the sense of humor, you know, he's kind of, like, cocky but not in like an off-putting way and he's just yeah i mean he's got it and you know exactly why and you can see in this movie of like why he was in the space of like one or two years became this huge big deal in the 80s and thankfully you know didn't succumb to like the trappings of fame and and uh you know stardom and he didn't go you know like a lot of child actors kind of go down a dark path um yeah yeah still married to the same woman too which in hollywood is like almost unheard of so mm -hmm. so really awesome so yeah i'm definitely looking forward to some of these films um that they're coming out that people can see them um uh, both this and the little richard one sound like they're they're going to be out soon or little richard is already out and then of course the judy bloom one is already on amazon prime so people can check that out there um thank you again Haley and ernie this is so much fun to get to have you both on the show um and have you on again hopefully for another episode where i've seen some more of the movies and we can have some more arguments <laughs> so because yeah. that's what the viewers want they want some drag <laughs> drag out fighting so um as always you can check us out on youtube and subscribe hit that little bell and subscribe button our website uh like us on facebook we're on uh cc media in salem scan tv and silverton and corvallis access media we're also on kmuz radio KMWV radio, and we have a podcast. So thanks again to Haley and Ernie. And uh, thank you. Have a great day and great movies. Bye. Bye. Bye.